We're all looking for the freshest produce available these days. So much so, many of us are growing our own vegetables. Since so many of us are getting into vegetable gardening, I thought it would be fun to take a look at some creative ways to grow and care for this delicious produce. We'll see some beautiful leafy greens that make up those salads we all enjoy, and talk about how to treat problems and perfect the soil for healthy growth. I'll visit with some interesting gardeners across the country who offer tips on how they grow vegetables, and you'll learn about a program that actually presents an opportunity for you to participate and growing fresh produce for you and your family. And for something delicious, I'll cook some of my favorite vegetables on an outdoor grill. Talk about good. We'll have some fun at the Tomato Festival in Carmel, California, and see some of the old-fashioned heirloom varieties that are still available to us today. I hope you'll join us when we come back. This is a familiar scene in summer at the height of the growing season. Customers eager to buy produce fresh off the farm. Farmers markets like this one have increased over 40% since 1994 because consumers are conscious of the importance of the nutritional benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables. Even though most of the farmers here are small, their collective impact is huge and growing. You see over one million Americans visit farmers markets each week across the country. Today, there are over 2,500 places like this where farmers bring in the great bounty of American agriculture. Such places provide those of us who live in urban and suburban areas, or who may not be able to grow their own, the opportunity to enjoy fresh produce grown in season and by people in our immediate communities. And if you're looking for fresh ideas for meals, there's no better place for inspiration than here. There are many projects across the country where communities support agriculture by participating in the growth of fresh produce. Chuck Crimmins is responsible for directing a successful example of community-supported agriculture. A community-supported agriculture project is a way to get fresh produce to people as quick as possible. What we do is invite people to buy a share of our garden, and then every week we harvest what's ready and bring it into a central drop-off spot near their home and they come and pick it up. People really seem to like it. It's as fresh as you can get it. It's all certified organic, of course. And uh, they just find that they're able to reconnect with the land, learn where their food comes from, learn when it's in season and when it's not in season because we only grow in season produce. And uh, we even invite them to come out and see where their food is grown. And some do take yeah. us up on that. This is a good way of, of marketing and buying produce, but the shareholder must understand that they are buying into a philosophy. They uh, are bearing the risk that the for farmer has borne alone up until now. They will get a lot if it's a good year. If it's a bad year or something happens to a specific crop, everybody shares the loss together. Rather than the poor farmer having to take <laughs> right. the loss all by himself, Bear the burden. everybody shares it. But we grow a lot and we always grow extra. We always grow more so that Hopefully the losses are minimal. As a shareholder, what would I expect first and when would I get it? Well, we start deliveries and nature always dictates yes, uh, when, when things start and stop. But we, we always tell people we start sometime in April, be it See. early, mid or late April, yeah. depending on what nature gives us. So it starts in April and it goes until end of October uh, when the first hard freeze shuts us down. Uh, in between that time, that 30 week interval, we deliver a basket weekly and it averages eight to 12 pounds. Now we tell people that's an average because in the early part of the season, lettuce and spinach don't weigh a whole lot. No. So they could get four or five pounds. But when the watermelon and muskmelon and tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini come in, they could be getting 25 or 30 pounds a week. It averages out eight to 12 pounds. We always like to be on the upper end, right. 12 pounds a week. 
but they do get a lot of produce. Americans are well known for their festivals. We have festivals for just about anything, including food. And here on the Central Coast in California, there are many reasons to celebrate because of all the delicious produce grown here. One of our favorite summer vegetables, or fruits for that matter, all across the country is the tomato. Millions of us grow them. The reason for a tomato fest is to create a celebration of the tomato harvest and to give my friends and people who are passionate about tomatoes an opportunity to taste more than 200 variety of heirloom tomatoes. Gary Ibsen has been coordinating the Carmel Valley Tomato Festival for over seven years, and it's all about showcasing the best tomato flavor in some creative ways. An heirloom tomato is real special. Uh, it has a history to it. Um, it's at least three generations old in order for it to be an heirloom tomato. Uh, it has usually a story behind it that is a real fascinating story. It comes with a people's story behind it. And most particularly, it has um, a lot of variety. There must be hundreds of varieties of heirloom tomatoes over the years. I think right now you could probably get a hold of maybe 200, 300. The range of flavor in heirloom tomatoes is immense. You get all the way from the really citrony, lemony, down to the real heavy, uh, real, having a lot of substance and uh, deep rich character to uh, sparkly, real rich tomato flavors the way they used to be. Um, I find as much variety in tomato flavors as there are in wines. There's no question that our sense of taste is a very complex system. The flavor of the fresh foods we eat can be influenced by many things, and tomatoes are no exception. You see, the variety we choose and the soil they're grown in, as well as how they're fed, can all influence their taste. I've been growing tomatoes organically for a number of years, and not on, only do I feel that it's my responsibility to treat the soil with integrity, but I feel that the tomatoes taste better. And I started here with a, a wild field that had nothing really in it, and uh, I added a lot of compost and soft rock phosphate and azomite rock dust and earthworm castings and I have a very healthy soil right now. One of the things I found the tomatoes have been most responsive to is foliar feeding which I do several times during a season and with a solution of fish emulsion and minerals and sea kelp I found that the tomato is able to uh, better resist pests and also resist some of the stress from winds. If you've ever grown that most popular of summer fruits, the tomato, you know at some point along the way they need a little support. For me, I find these cages handy. They work well in my small raised beds. However, for growing a lot of tomato plants, there are other methods of support that are more efficient. Here at Earthbound Farms, farm manager Mark Marino, an organic grower of quality vegetables and hundreds of tomato plants, showed me how he gets the job done. Well, Alan, I've been using this system for about 15 years, and it's really simple. You just plant the tomato plants in a line, as you can see, about 18 inches apart. And then when they get about 12 inches high, you put in the stakes about every 12 feet. And then starting at about 10 inches, every 10 inches or so, I take the twine down one side, come back the other side, and it leaves the double row of twine here that supports the plants from falling over. When you wrap it around each pole, that cinches it really tight, and it stays there, and you tie it off at the end. And it's really a beautiful, easy support system that's inexpensive and simple to create and easy to take apart at the end of the year. So we've used it here, like I said, for about 15 years, and it's never failed us yet. We get bumper crops. It lets a lot of light and air into the uh, plants and the fruit, too, and that's really what you want, that good air and light circulation for a healthy, beautiful, quality fruit. We've all heard the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. 
Well, that certainly holds true when you're growing tomatoes. After you spend all of the time planting them and bringing them along, nothing's any more heartbreaking than to have part of your crop destroyed by something like blossom end rot. You see, blossom end rot is actually a deficiency of calcium. You've probably seen it. It starts at the bottom of a tomato. It's pale brown in the beginning and then turns black and flattens the bottom of the fruit. Now, to keep my plants from producing similar fruit, I started in the beginning when I planted them and sweetened the soil slightly, since mine is acidic, with a bit of lime, because lime is a good source of calcium. Another condition that seems to contribute to blossom end rot is irregular levels of moisture in the soil. So what I'm doing is putting down a soaker hose, and once I get it in place, I'll cover it with a generous layer of straw mulch. This will help keep the soil consistently moist. Another thing you can do once the plants mature a bit and begin to set fruit is actually spray them with liquid calcium. This is readily available at garden centers and nurseries. Just follow the directions on the label and spray it directly on the plants. With a little advanced planting, I can expect a bounty of healthy, tasty tomatoes this year. I'm always looking for ways to extend my gardening season. Every year I try to plant a fall vegetable garden to take advantage of those last few warm days. But even in the mildest climates, temperatures can drop suddenly and cause big problems in the garden. So I'm always looking for solutions. I came up with a simple design for a cold frame. It sits right on top of the raised beds in my vegetable garden. The first step in putting this together is to build a two by four frame. And to save time, I had the boards pre-cut at the lumber yard. This concrete reinforcing wire is strong stuff. It's the key to the support. Now, it can be purchased in standardized rolls and then cut to fit your cold frame. Now, I always try to cut enough to create an arc that's at least 24 inches high at the highest point. This gives me plenty of room for ventilation and enough room to work. I attach the wire with large staples and then secure this four mil plastic sheeting with smaller staples and I use a nylon fabric strip to keep it from tearing. Ventilation is important, and you can get this by leaving the ends open or cutting slits in the top. Cold frames are a great way to protect plants and extend the gardening season. You know I love good things to eat. One of my favorite ways to start any meal is with a salad, salads of any kind. I suppose that's one of the reasons I enjoy growing so many of my own salad greens. You know, things like arugula, spinach, cabbage, and most importantly, lettuce. My vegetable garden may be small, but you'd be surprised just how much fresh produce these raised beds can deliver. One of the reasons is that I can get such an early start in the spring, thanks to the protection these homemade plastic covers provide. Now these aren't hothouses. They just slightly raise the soil temperature and keep it more consistent. You see, lettuce actually prefers the cool temperatures of late winter and early spring. In fact, if you've ever tried to grow lettuce in the hot summer, you know it can languish in the heat. Butter crunch is one of my all-time favorites, and I also enjoy the more heat-resistant red sale, and another one with reddish leaves called red oak leaf. These can all be grown easily from seed, and they'll germinate in just a few days after covering them with only a dusting of soil and a light spray of water and liquid fertilizer. You know, beauty doesn't always have to come through the flower. It can also come through the foliage. And one of the best examples of this is with lettuce. Here in Mr. Kaysen's vegetable garden at Callaway Gardens, David Chambers has been growing vegetables for over 24 years, and he's done some interesting things with lettuce. With so many different varieties of lettuce and such great texture, it's an ideal plant for any kind of garden. It is. The homeowners can really take advantage of all the different colors and plant it early in the spring. And then again in the fall, if you've missed the spring planting, we can start it again in the fall. And you can even grow it in, in all kinds of containers. We have different size pots. This one here is red sails in a clay pot. Looks like about a six inch pot. How many plants would you have in there? I think we have three plants. And this is, a, like I said, a real leafy type. 
which would probably do better than those butterhead uh, type lettuces because you get the more upright growth. But it gives you that pretty color. You can harvest and still keep the pot uh, growing for a, a later harvest. And when you harvest the red sail, would you take the outer leaves and let the center of it remain and, and keep taking the outer leaves? You could, you can do it that way, or you could actually cut out uh, at the base and then these others will actually fill in. They still have about another uh, three weeks to a month growing time. With all the beautiful textures and colors of the lettuce, this vegetable garden is as pretty as any flower garden. And the great thing about it is that it's edible. I notice you've got your potatoes in baskets. That's a clever way to grow those among the lettuce. I guess we took the bottoms out of some old baskets that were starting to deteriorate, so the bottom was already gone. Right. <laughs> and uh, it gives us a good way to hold our good, valuable compost and put it around the potato Excellent. and not lose any of it to, uh, to the sides. And then the big advantage comes when it's time to harvest. It's just a one simple pull the basket up, all the potatoes are right there and no digging in heavy soil to, to look for the potatoes, so there's less chance of damage on your potato. And you've made great use of limited space as well. There's no question that the quality of your soil is an essential component of your garden's performance. Inexpensive soil tests are available through cooperative extension offices in most states. There are also private labs that, for a fee, can help you assess and understand your soil's needs. However, you should be prepared because these reports can take time to complete. When you take a soil sample from your garden, you'll want to collect several to reach an average. You can do this by taking eight to 10 core samples, six to eight inches deep, in various parts of the area where you'll be planting. When I need quick results, I use one of these home soil testing kits. It can help me with my soil pH. It can let me know whether it's too acidic or too alkaline. It can also help me determine whether my soil is deficient of the three basic elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. All I need is the soil kit itself, a plastic spoon, some distilled water, and of course, the soil. To check pH, you just put soil, water, and a pH tablet in the test tube. Then shake and compare the color of the solution to the color on the chart. According to this test, my soil is slightly acidic, which is ideal for growing some great tasting tomatoes. There's nothing like enjoying the flavor of fresh vegetables, whether you grow them yourself or pick them up at the market. One of my favorite ways to cook vegetables is just to put them on a grill. You can't beat the flavor of fresh squash, onions, bell peppers, and eggplant when cooked on an open fire. Virtually any vegetable is suitable for grilling, and you'll be surprised at how good they taste. I like to make a simple marinade from vinegar, olive oil, a little crushed garlic, and whatever herbs I happen to have, and of course some salt and pepper. Now once I've prepared the marinade, I just quickly coat the vegetables on all sides, top and bottom. Now if you're using small, delicate vegetables like mushrooms and new potatoes, you'll want to keep them from falling through the grill. Just use a piece of aluminum foil with holes punctured in it. Or if you're lucky enough to find one of these grilling baskets, they're ideal. The open wire mesh of these baskets will allow the smoke to flavor the vegetables and turning them as a snap. I just place larger vegetables like peppers and eggplants directly onto the grate and a medium to hot fire will have them ready before you know it. So you'll need to watch them closely, turning them as each side begins to brown. When you already have the grill set up for chicken or steak, try grilling some fresh vegetables to round out the meal. The taste is great. We're all beginning to realize the important role gardening plays in all of our lives. Whether or not we actually garden ourselves, we rely on and owe a lot to our nation's dedicated farmers for supplying us with the food that sustains us. Gardening is such a significant part of our history, and we should be more mindful of its importance today. 
If you'd like more information on how to grow some of your own vegetables and some great tasting recipes, just check out our website. And I hope you'll join us again next week for more visits in the garden. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh, No, I can't help but smile